Welcome to the Healing Trauma Podcast, a space for those who are healing from complex and developmental trauma. Introducing your host, Monique Coven, a certified trauma recovery coach, survivor, and thriver. The intent of the podcast is to provide helpful information with insight that can validate, encourage, and support you on your healing journey. You're going to hear stories from other survivors and trauma experts, featuring therapists, coaches, and practitioners. We will open up the conversation on effective trauma healing modalities, practices, and tools. If you are interested in trauma recovery coaching, as well as recommended books and healing resources, head over to www.thehealingtraumapodcast.com. And now, here is your host, Monique Coven. Today, I'm going to share with you a beautiful conversation I had with Samantha Messias. Samantha is just a beautiful soul. She's a survivor of early developmental and complex trauma, and she's going to share a little bit about her story and also about how she is healing. And she is actually an award-winning hyper-realistic artist, which is a pencil portrait specialist. And I have seen her work, and it just blows me away. And she will say that this came out of, this gift that she has has come out of her trauma. So I will issue a trigger warning because there is some discussion of sexual childhood abuse. I hope that you will find this episode helpful and that in some ways this will validate you and encourage you along on your trauma healing journey. Hi, Samantha. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, Monique. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here. Uh, it's, a, it's an honor to be sitting with you and talking with you and listening to your story. I guess while you're in front of me, is going to be amazing. I read a part of your story. I think it was on a blog or somewhere. And I said, oh my goodness, I was so inspired. I said, I have to have you come on here and share your incredible story with, um, with the podcast audience. So thank you so much for being here. And I really feel that, you know, it's so interesting. I have to say this. So many of us who've had trauma and these horrible things happen, the first Mm -hmm. thing we often feel is shame. And when I'm around a survivor, I always feel honor, honor. I don't know why, but I just feel like uh, honored. It's an honor. So I'm, I just want you to know it's an honor for me to be here with you and for you to share. So maybe we could start by you introducing yourself a little bit, maybe a bit of your story and, you know, we're going to talk about your story and then we're going to talk about where you are today. So go ahead. Oh, thank you, Monique. Um, So yes, my name is Samantha Messias. A lot of people know me as a self-taught hyper-realistic artist. I'm quite well known for that on on, um, online and things like that. But also accompanying my artwork is my story of trauma, you know, triumph over trauma. There's a lot of... um, a lot of pain that can be seen in my artwork. You know, I use my artwork as a form of healing, as a form of therapy, and it's always been that for me throughout my whole entire life. Um, I see myself as a thriver. I like to call it a thriver, not survivor, (laughs) a thriver. So it's sort of like a part like, yeah, I'm a survivor, but now I'm learning how to thrive, you know, and I'm really doing that through multiple ways on how to heal because like you said with going through abuse um, or going through any type of trauma the, there is a lot of shame there is a lot of guilt there, there is a lot of anger you know despair and, and sometimes it's really hard if you don't fully know what's going on in the brain and in the body it can be really 
it can be really confusing. It can be really confusing. So I've been able to the past sort of eight to 10 years, I've been on a healing journey, um, which has led me down, you know, the spiritual path, meditations, affirmations, mantras, all of that. And which is still, you know, still incorporated today. Then it's led me down a path of health and exercise and well-being and vegan lifestyle. And then it's led me down another path of trying out all these new, um, you know, therapies and healings and and even taking medication, which I was against for so long. Um, you know, and, and unfortunately, the other very not so positive coping mechanisms, self-harm and mm-hmm. suicide attempts and and just not understanding how to self-soothe or properly mm-hmm. reg- regulate my emotions. I find a lot of um, trauma survivors, um, we find it difficult to regulate our emotions. But yeah, it's, my story, you know, goes back from childhood, like everyone else's story. Um, I was one of eight, so I was the youngest. All of my siblings were taken off my parents from birth pretty much because um different some, a lot of them different dads um but they were unable to look after them you know with with my mum's history of you know drug abuse alcohol abuse um I found out later on that she'd been through um trauma herself you know being abused um and because back in the day it wasn't so it it wasn't so open you know to be able to talk about this you know we've got access now to technology we can find things out so easily and we can you know it's becoming very mainstream still still needs to be more mainstream but the whole mental health awareness you know mental health you need you need to look after it and you know speak up about it and all that it's becoming more it's becoming more open for for discussion um but because obviously my mom and dad at the time they'd had their own traumas Um, And this is where, when I did a lot of my healing, a lot of my research was realizing we weren't evil people, (laughs) because that's what I used to always think. It wasn't because I was an evil child and I deserved this. It was unfortunately their level of awareness at that time. It was their level of consciousness, their traumas that they had unresolved as to why they'd inflict that on somebody else. It was was a process of really trying to understand and, and have sympathy and then have forgiveness. Forgiveness is very hard to get to. Would I say I've forgiven them? Yeah, yeah. Does it still hurt? Yes, of course it still hurts. Do I see a blessing in disguise in all of that experience? Yes, I do, because I wouldn't be where I am today. Um, I wouldn't have this incredible skill. Yeah, I, you've basically sort of shared a lot of the things that we that we think about when we think about our traumatic experiences, you know, this idea of, um, you know, they, they, they didn't do it on purpose. They, they were not informed. They didn't have awareness. They had generational trauma, all those things, forgiveness. Do I forgive? If I forgive, then I can be free, all those things. And I, I, I hear you. And I think we all sort of struggle with those things, but at different times, you know, different times. Um, some people at the beginning of the, of the journey, if you bring up the, just the idea of forgiveness, it's like, I know it's like, (laughs) Whoa, you know, and, and, but let's get back to your story. Let's get back to the beginning. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I was, like I said, one of a big family. Um, and I remember I have certain memories um from living with my parents I was living with them from obviously birth up until around about five so I was adopted at five and my mum noticed um when she came home and at the age of two she noticed my dad um you know exposing himself to me um and getting me to do not very you know nice things you know, a two-year-old should be playing with, you know, sands and toys and, you know, and having fun. But instead I was being sexually abused. Um, and because my mum had seen this, she instinctively, I know she, it must've been really hard for her because she's had all her children taken off her because of the, the drug and the alcohol. Um, she reports it to the police and the police, you know, we're going to do, we're going to do like an investigation, but then she later on retracted the allegation. 
and said she made up. And I've I've actually found that this it can be quite common with um with like incest and family family abuse like that. And there's a family member that that's not necessarily the abuser, but they're just as bad because they're actually just allowing it to happen. Mm-hmm. under the roof because you know when you think of it back then it's like well this person's providing food on the table you know this person instead of having those boundaries and saying no I will find another way to provide for me and my child mm-hmm. my first protocol and priority is to keep this child and me safe from that that's what should have been here normal response but it wasn't so I then endured um physical physical abuse um repeated sexual abuse and I was um, neglected um I w- wasn't fed properly I was starved and um, I remember there being like needles and things like that and parties and people just not in a safe place and that went on for three extra years mm. so up until five and then eventually um you know my mom eventually then you know it carried on with the with the let, letting the police know and the local authorities know that no this is wrong and you know Samantha needs more protection and more safety and plus I had a voice then so I could actually say oh okay my daddy's doing this or my my mummy's doing this and that's when they were like okay this isn't this we need to take this child away and protect her it took them long enough but you know at least it was at the age of five you know I did go to so I just want to yeah. clarify yeah. so did your mom report it and then social services got involved when you were, I guess, before yeah. five? She did yeah. finally report it? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So she did finally, finally report that, yeah. And then I, I remember earlier before the before the recording, um, I was mentioning about um, getting the police. There was a recording. I've not watched it. I didn't want to watch it. I know if I was to dig deep, I'd be able to find it. But in the police station, they recorded me saying things that, you know, a five-year-old shouldn't really have the awareness of at that age. And that's when they were like, yeah, you know, this is this is not not great. So, so yeah, so those first five years were just so much trauma for anyone to endure, especially from your loved ones, those people that are supposed to be there for you, they're supposed to protect you, they're supposed to provide for you and care for you and support you. But instead they were doing sort of like the opposite and only from what they knew was was the right thing to do. You know, I I try, it's hard because sometimes like we try and some people, we, we try to understand why people would do that. And I think that's what's led me on this, on this journey of, wanting to really delve deep into the mind of 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 like trauma how trauma affects the body but also how what happens in people's lives to inflict that trauma onto people Mm -hmm. so I can understand I think when you have understanding you have clarity and it allows you to move 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 through things more easily Mm -hmm. so yeah the first so having that having all of that and realizing then understanding about the the fight flight or freeze response and understanding okay even though all this trauma happened years ago why is it affecting me now Mm. why is it that it is it's literally as if my body is in that experience now like what is going on and that's what again had to lead me to do the research what's going on in my body why is this happening yeah and people are like yeah yeah yeah. Um, and, you know, I, I'm so happy that today there's a lot more you could do research. When I was a young mom and I looked up, there was zero, nothing. Oh, okay. And then when I went out for professionals to ask, why is this happening in my body? Why do I feel like like I did when I was zero? Nothing. I mean, wow. <laughs> I know. So so let's get back to um, five years old. You said you were adopted. Yes. You want to tell us yeah. about that? Yeah, so that's another, you know, it's another sort of trauma in itself because as a child, you you just want to stay with your parents. You have this crazy primal internal attachment. Even if your parents are abusing you, you do not want to leave them because mm. that, that unfortunately you don't. So I remember it was very traumatic being pulled away from my mom and not understanding fully why and because I in my mind this is life it's normal your parents cheat I've not I've not I never had any other um 
any other experience or mm. or something to compare it to to compare it against so I was like okay this is this is just the normal way that humans mm-hmm. are raised things so when they were taking me away from my own good I was like no you're taking away taking me away from my mom and I love my mom yeah. so they I went to I think it was a, about two care homes for maybe like temporarily foster homes for maybe a week or two before I found a permanent place with my lovely parents who unfortunately they have in my adopted parents they've passed away um Alice and Vinnie Clark so um I was adopted um by yeah by those two um after I think may have been it may have been a few weeks maybe a few months I'm not fully sure on time because time can get sort of skewed when you go back so far um so maybe a few weeks maybe a couple of months um but I remember when I was there, I remember being five and having a bag of dummies. And I'm five. Now, when you're five, you shouldn't really have dummies. You've grown <laughs> out of them. It was a comfort for me. But I couldn't, like I said, um, in my story, if people read my story online, I couldn't speak because of what I, I'd witnessed. Not that I phys- I could speak. I could put words together. I just almost went mute with, with the trauma. Um, and I think it was... I don't know whether it was both of them, the two incredible ladies that um, I look up to and inspirational figures are Maya Angelou and Oprah Winfrey. And both have went through, you know, sexual abuses as children. And I'm sure both of them, um, they went mute for a while after their their traumas as well. So it's just because of what you see and what you experience. Sometimes you can't put it into words at that age. So I began to communicate through, through drawing. Yeah. So when you went, so when you went to this new family uh, yeah. and they adopted you, are you saying at the beginning you were not able to speak with them, or you could say a few words, or? No, I didn't. Sp- it was a good few months. I just, I didn't speak. It was very. They were, you know, encouraging me. Um, I just, you know, I may have probably said the odd one word or or yes or, or no or nodded my head, but I just, it was all bizarre to me. I'm like, where am I? I'm five. No one wants me. That's how I felt. I'm in a house that I don't know where I am on the planet. There's all these other kids running around the place. There's a TV in the corner. It seems quite lively, quite nice. But because of me being so hyper vigilant and so scared, everything was just <clears> it was, I was living in such a state of fear. I just remember being so scared. But I will always remember the first day I got there because I remember going into the living room there was a TV there. There was a few kids sitting on the floor. There was a few people around. It was quite it was quite a lot of people in the house. And um, I just remember being there, standing there, watching it all happening and just being, being a bit confused, but also being intrigued as well by it all. Like, who are all these people? What, what's going on? What am I doing here? So, yeah. yeah. I'm, just, I'm just thinking about, um, you know, this was how many years ago about? So I am 32. So what we say, yeah, about 23 years ago, 24 yeah. years ago. I'm just hoping because I mean, even logically, we think a child who has been through such extreme trauma, we know we have it on file. Don't you think that they would need some integration, some preparation, some, uh, you know, a therapy before introduce introducing gently explaining you know all of that like they just put you in there with no uh, that's unbelievable yeah. unbelievable so it's, it's similar to what you said before um Monique about and um, when you were when when you first went to like therapy or you first went onto the internet there was like no information about yeah. any of that yeah. um and it was the same in the in obviously that was so uh, I was born 1989 early 90s late <sighs> 80s the wasn't the mm-hmm. I look back now and with all the knowledge I had I'm like oh my god I could create just an incredible plan to, yes. to allow children and even the adopted parents to understand and there's a new f- a phrase circling the internet at the minute in like the 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 healing trauma you know community which is trauma informed having yep. trauma yeah, trauma-informed educators, trauma-informed adopted parents, trauma-informed health Fos- practitioners. But you know trauma-informed foster care i'm really yeah, hoping yeah, that that's yeah. happening now i don't know 
yeah yeah well it's it's not it's not mainstream it's not but I'm, I'm noticing little pockets because I keep you know I want to keep tabs of all of this and and just bring more awareness so it's happening in certain areas but still there's so many parents and so many teachers and adoptive parents they just don't understand why kids are the way <coughs> they are and yeah. I remember growing up and I found it very difficult so for example because of what I'd gone through and because of what I thought was normal growing up, because we only learn from those those were around. Um, I it was noted in my little file that Samantha needs to be watched, carefully watched around males. Because what you know, if I'm used to going to an a crotch area of a male, you know, I'm obviously that's that's my introduction. Yes. It's not right. like, oh hi, you know, and unfortunately that's the sad reality of of yeah. that condition of mind as a young child. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and and so it was like she needs to be looked after that way. But the one thing that I noticed with my adoptive parents, Alice and Vinnie Clark, who were just incredible, they gave me a lot of life skills in terms of, you know, don't jump in the car with strangers and, you know, be mindful of who you speak to and make sure you dress properly and don't, you know, wear too short skirts and all of this stuff. <laughs> However, um, and they gave me love and they gave me tough love, a lot of tough love, which I think that's what helped. But there wasn't enough acknowledgement. There wasn't enough yeah. compassion or empathy as to what I've been through. It was very much, it's over now, hush, hush under the rug. But what they, what they didn't realise was trauma doesn't just get pushed, hushed under the rug. It lingers and it lingers hardcore and with loads of um, detrimental effects, you know, in the in the adult self. So addiction, self-harms, all of this um, until it gets processed, until you can, until someone gives you a safe space to say, you know what, that happened. That was shit. That was horrible. What happened? I'm so sorry. Talk to me about it. Tell me about it. Cry, scream, kick. Tell me about it. I'm here with no judgment, no criticism. I'm not telling you to, you know, big, big boys, big girls don't cry. Shush, shush now. And, you know, and just trying to suppress it because it's too much for me to handle. It's like, no, we, we need to talk about this. The only way you can heal, you need to lift it up and bring it to the surface. <clears throat> but unfortunately, so many people don't want to. And I understand why. I do understand why. But it's not, it's not going to help. It's not the solution. It's not going to help. It's going to make it worse. But we see it already. Yeah, I think that's so common that just just don't talk about it. Just, you know, get on with it and um, trauma-informed. Trauma-informed. We are trauma-informed without a doubt. Yeah. You know, you can't, you, it's, it's, it's almost, it's almost like someone slapping you in the face by saying, get over it or it happens. 20 years ago or mm -hmm. oh it's fine now you know you move forward or or, or, or you've got this to look at and focus on mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but the thing is they don't understand how trauma affects the nervous system how trauma affects the brain how trauma affects the adult self that's why so many people are depressed so many people are anxious so many people have loads of addictions and mm -hmm. you know self-destructive habits and it's because of unresolved trauma they just haven't got a clue how to yeah. deal with it yeah. And that's my little piece why I have this podcast so that people could start to get informed and understand because you're right. It, 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 like you said, slap in the face, it almost feels like they're trying to deny the reality that we're feeling yeah. by saying, look what you have now it's over. Yeah. It's okay now. Yeah. But my body is still, is still shaking. Yes. My body hasn't, it's still carrying Okay, yes. but that's the past. It's over. You know, let it go. Let it put that put that down. Um, I would if I could. Oh, yes. Yeah, and that's we're not, we're not doing it as a choice. No. But but that's because what we know now we didn't know then was trauma doesn't yeah. live in the mind and stories. It's not a cognitive thing. It's physiological. Trauma is physiological. Trauma recovery is about finding safety. Safety, firstly, in our bodies. And then in our experience, in relationships with others. And so part of the work that I do as a trauma recovery coach is help you to begin to get unstuck in those responses that are really in the body. As we know, trauma doesn't live in our thoughts or in our cognitions. Yes, our thoughts play a part, but it begins in our somatic experience. 
through the coaching experience, I will give you tools and support to help you to begin to move through those responses where you often find yourself stuck. To find out more about my trauma recovering coaching offerings, you can visit my website at www.thehealingtraumapodcast.com. So I want to get to, um, you know, you talked about being mute and then picking up, I guess, some form, I don't know, uh, a pencil or something where you started to express yourself and your trauma through, through that. Could you tell us about that? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I remember going into a room. I'm not too sure. I'm just from a big round table, wooden table. And I'm sure it was a room that they would, um, you know, either observe me or just, you know, do little checks on me, but also a meeting place for my mum because she'd still come in and see me now and again. And I remember them putting down paper, gave me some colored pens, pencils, and I began to draw. And um, some of the drawings were quite, you know, quite dark because I draw like, like black. I I'd always I'd describe it now as like a black m mass. Um, and that was what I interpreted that fear of my father. So the mm. black mass with, with like scary eyes. And I draw quite a lot of that. And I remember even a few years back, cause I do a lot of, um, I say a lot, not, not as much as I'd like to do now. Um, because I probably healed to such an extent, I feel like I don't necessarily need to, but I used to do a lot of journaling and, and free, um, free thought writing. So whatever came to mind, I'd just write. And then I'd read it back. You know, I'd do it quite, um, it'd be almost like unconscious. I'd just write, 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 write. And then some drawings and scribbles would come up. And then once I'd put my pencil down, I'd go away, come back, and I'd read it again. And I'd be like, oh, my God, did I just put that? It was like, it, it, yeah, it was strange. Free free writing. It's really um, it's really good to just get stuff out. Um, but I remember, yeah, doing all of this drawing. And I then, cre I then ended up, being falling in love with art and and I remember sitting there in my in my adopted parents house Alice and Vinnie I'd always draw the fruit bowl mm -hmm. I'd always draw the fruit bowl I'd love drawing fruit bowls <laughs> and then in school you know picked it up did art at school but people look at the skill level that I've got today and people are like obviously blown away by what <laughs> I create and um, but a lot of them say we well, did you go to, to art school or college <laughs> or university and I said no because I would have went but a teacher, when I was very young, um, she said, Samantha, what do you want to be when you're older? And I was like, I want to be an artist. And she basically, in a nutshell, sort of crushed my dreams by basically saying, um, you know, it's not really, it's not really um like like feasible in terms of, you know, a lot of because we were drawing a lot of the artists at the time, like Roy Lichtenstein, Henry Matisse, um, Andy Warhol, and you know, and and people like that and and she was saying well the you know they, they don't really make it until like they die they don't really become you know famous and basically I remember it because I remember the feeling and it's like what Maya Angelou says she says um people will forget what you said forget what you did but they'll never forget how you made them feel and I remember her making me feel like I couldn't achieve it mm -hmm. I remember it so clearly that I'm not 100% sure on what she said because I was very young, but it was basically saying, you know, people don't really make it and, you know, it's going to take a while and and all this stuff instead of going, oh, my God, Samantha, yes, you can do anything. If you work hard and put your mind to it, you're you're fantastic. So, no. Um, so I then ended up changing the course of direction and thinking, how can I turn my creativity into something I can make money money from? So I was like, fashion. So I did fashion at college, fashion design and clothing at university, um, showed my collection at Graduate Fashion Week in London, worked with yeah. Alexander McQueen in placement. Oh. And, you know, I remember graduating um, um, university and I just, I'm saying to myself, what is it I want to do? Just ignore everything else. Ev just get rid of everything out of your mind. What is it Samantha wants to do? And the answer came back up again. I want to be an artist. <laughs> so it's like, right, pick up the pencils. Let's start. <laughs> let's go. And then it just carried on from there. Oh, my goodness. That's incredible. You know, when did you start to realize that, um, hey, I'm pretty good? <laughs> <laughs> um, 
it was <laughs> most it was the albert einstein portrait now people can just type in like samantha messiah's albert einstein portrait on google you can you can have a little look and um, it looks like a photograph but it's not it's hundreds of hours of pencil and charcoal and it was my first attempt at a hyper-realistic drawing. Um, I found hyper-realism in 2012. Yes, 2012. Um, I created that portrait in 2013, I believe. Um, and I couldn't believe it. I was I was like, no way are these pencil drawings. How are people doing these? Oh, my goodness. So I was like, I'm going to try it. So I typed into Google because people always say, how did you learn? And I said, well, I went into Google and typed in how to draw more realistically and then followed all the tabs. <laughs> and there was one tab that I found, which was an artist. Um, and she said, use a grid method. You know, um, people like... Um, Leonardo da Vinci, um, Michelangelo, they, they used to use a form of a grid method to help to help get all the proportions right, the features in the right place. So I did it. I gridded out um, a reference of an eye. That was my first ever drawing of, an, of a little eye and then began to draw it. And it was like, oh, my God, it looks pretty much identical. I was like, oh, OK. Then my second attempt was a hand with water on. And my partner came home from work and he was like, wow, that's amazing. <laughs> and then my third attempt was Albert Einstein, which I just decided to do. Starting little grids, my brain sees things as tiny details and, you know, it doesn't see as a whole because people say, why do you start? Because people, a lot of people have called me like a human printer. And if you have a look at my work and my time-lapse videos, you'll see why they call me the human printer. Because in traditional art teaching, they teach you to start from the eyes and work your way out. I start from the bottom left-hand corner and wake up in grids and columns and little, yeah, that's wow. how I start. <laughs> that's amazing. So, I mean, I'll, I'm going to put a link so people can have a look at your work. And by the way, you have to look at it. Uh, recently, <laughs> you've, I don't know how recent, but I, I saw some work that you've done of some, you know, well-known people. Do you want to name a few? Yeah, yeah. So I've done people like um, singer Adele. So I know a lot of people know Adele at the minute. She's really big. Um, and here Paige shared my artwork as well on Twitter. So my Twitter account was going crazy. I was like, oh, wow. The singer Jessie J. Um, I love her. If you listen to some of her older music, the word in, in her music is so incredibly empowering for everyone. It's um, I could listen to her album over and over again. Um so I did hear she she reposted and shared that, which was wonderful. Um, I've done people like, like I said, Maya Angelou, Oprah Winfrey, Marilyn Monroe, Ellen DeGeneres, women that have been through similar experiences um, and people that have have triumphed over trauma and, and have led such inspirational and positively impactful lives to help other people and to inspire other people um you know even people like Nelson Mandela I did a portrait of him Albert Einstein like I said before and um, I've done um Princess Diana of Wales um you know I have done recently Sir Sir Richard Branson who who I know has my piece of his artwork of the portrait I did him um so yeah I've done a lot of famous faces um I, I'm definitely going to be doing a lot more um people that are not just famous for getting the boobs out or <laughs> for doing something crazy that doesn't really add value or benefit the planet but yeah more of those inspirational iconic figures and along with that you know I do a lot of commissions and pets and family portraits but I also yeah. create in my own time artwork that is around trauma and yeah. that provokes people's emotions I, 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 the thing is I'll, I'll, I create, I've created a few pieces, but going forward, I will create a lot more pieces that create a trigger, not a, not a trigger where you're like shocked and like, like a negative, like, like a negative, a trigger for emotion, because yeah. the best way for us to, to really grow in consciousness and to really heal is if we feel we're so, we're so detached from our emotions and I understand, I get why, because emotions are so painful sometimes, but we need to reconnect. We need to integrate. We need to, we need to really feel again and realize that you're not alone and it's okay. And some of the pieces that I've created, I've done one that was entitled my childhood. 
which was of a little girl clasping a teddy bear. And, you know, there was a man in the, like, you can see a ta- like a small section of like a man with a belt buckle open and a bottle in his hand, oh. but it's all hyper realistic. And I remember people, when I posted that, people were like, oh my God, Samantha, is this you? And I was like, no, it's a representation of me, but it, it went, the amount of messages I got from it was insane saying, thank you, it happened to me or wow, you're so brave and your inspiration. And, and it really touched my heart because it's like, there's so many people that it happens to. Like, I think there was a study that came out saying like one in four, one in five people, mm. you know, being like sexually abused as children. And I was just like, wow, it, it's crazy. But we all feel so alone and creating these pieces, not only does it help people to realize that one, they're not alone, but also, well, hey, look at her. She's been through all of this. You know, she has struggled, but she seems to be doing quite well with herself. She seems to be healing or she she's going after her dreams and she's, you know, amassing great success. OK, so what what is she doing? Um, and it, that's sort of the art is, is healing in itself and it, it created a piece I wanted to take my own life unfortunately on numerous occasions but this time was about a year and a half ago so it wasn't even that long and one of the reasons for that was because I just lost my first child so I was pregnant you know I mm. and we found out who was poorly baby Owen and a five months old you oh. know I had birth to him and it was you know, what that what that that had triggered every trauma all the loss all the grief oh, yes. you know and then I went back into that victim mentality like why me I hate <clears> life you know I was even like I hate God or, I hate this you know and I was very very angry and I was very heartbroken I was in a lot of pain a lot of despair and I attempted to take my own life and I remember I remember as I was getting ready to do 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 the deed take my own life it was almost like I had this voice or this, this like this thought. It, it was, it was, I can't quite explain it. It wasn't like, I don't know. People say sometimes it could be divine intervention or it just could be your subconscious mind or your survival mode. I had like a flash. First off, it was like a flash of me sort of hanging and my partner coming in. And I, it was like a voice was saying, what would, what would your partner think? Because me and my partner have been together for like 13 years. We've lived together for that long. We met at uni where, you know, I believe we are true soulmates. We've got a lot of communi- communication and a lot of understanding and empathy for one another. Um, and I thought to myself, I can't do that to Andy. I could mm-hmm. not, I could not do that to him. Um, and then another sort of voice or, or thought came to mind was go and draw yourself. Go and draw, go and draw, go and draw a portrait. Go and draw the biggest portrait you've ever done of yourself which I've only, I've only done one, one, this was the second portrait. The first portrait was a little tiny thing that I did. And um, it was quite a funny one with me pulling a tongue. And this one was like, you know, a big portrait and it was called Contemplation. And that's obviously on my website, it's online. And um, I've exhibited that in a London um, gallery as well. And one of the reasons I called it Contemplation because I was contemplating taking my life before mm. drawing it. So it, there's a lot of meaning behind it, but I want to create... I'm getting to the point now where I have a voice. I want to use a voice for not just me, but for other people who still feel silenced by the trauma. Um, and I feel confident about it. And you know what? I'm at that point in my life where I'm like, you know what? If people don't like it, they don't like it. There's nearly 8 billion people on the planet. Not everyone's going to be your cup of tea. You know, you're, they're not going to be your cup of tea. You know, you're not going to be their cup of tea. And it's fine. Make peace with that. But there will be some people that will resonate with you, yeah. that will you that will love what you've got to say and that will thank you so much because yeah. because just by you sharing has saved their life in some way yeah yeah uh, you you know when what you're talking about also is that those portraits when people are writing to you or saying thank you what you're doing is you're you're giving them validation for their their experience you're a witness to their experience um which is which is incredible Wow. Thank you so much for sharing that. So, I mean, let's talk about, let's talk about realistically where you are because, um, you know, I, I, I think we need to be really honest that trauma healing is, is, 
it's messy and it can be beautiful <laughs> and it can be hard and painful and it can be beautiful and it can be, you know, horrible at times and it can be beautiful. And it, so it's this, it's this dual, I think, dual thing where it can be lovely and it can be not so lovely at the same time. So tell us about yourself. Like, how is your journey right now? Yeah, right now it feels, it feels good. <laughs> um, it does, it feels, it feels good. But I just want to touch on what you've just said then about, you know, if, if one minute it can be beautiful, then next minute it will be messy. And it's like an ebb and flow. It's like a wave. So I see my my healing and my trauma as a wave. So, you know, for me, I've had multiple traumas, you know, the the abuse, the 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 being ripped up from my parents, the the um the betrayal, then the death of both my parents and never really being able to um to consolidate with them and to say what I, yeah. you know, never yes. that answer. And then the uh, death of my adopted parents and then, th- you know, having issues like the PTSD, which was horrendous. It's, the, you know, I pretty much, if you think of PTSD at one point for like three years of my life, it was at a hundred percent. Like uh, it was, uh, you know, the toast would pop up from the toaster and I would literally break down. I'd be like, oh my God, what was that? I couldn't put the smoothie making on for too long because the loud noise would trigger mm-hmm. me. It was really, really, it was horrible. Um, you know, but going through all of this, it's like, it's a, it's a wave and you've got to learn how to ride the wave. That's why I, I like to describe it. You learn how to ride the wave and how, how do you learn how to ride the wave? You start doing the inner work. You start cultivating self-compassion, which is key, which I am still working on because Unfortunately, with the trauma, I watched the, definitely anyone that wants to, you know, really go in and start to heal. There's a gentleman that I watched an 18, 19 minute YouTube video, um, Dr. Gabor, Gabor Mate, Dr. Mm-hmm. Gabor Mate. Phenomenal, phenomenal. And he really explains to you about, um, you know, the emotions and the trauma and how to heal them and things like that. But the self-compassion you know, you've got to, you've got to start doing the inner work. So you've got to look at yourself. You've got to look at the wounds. You've got to, you've got to, and it's going to be painful. It's going to be ugly. It's going to be horrible. You may have to go to therapy. You may even have to go on medication to sort of dull the symptoms, the traumatic symptoms. So you can process on a better level. That may be a solution for you. Um, But I think at the minute for me is it's been learning to, give myself compassion and empathy um because with the trauma that happens it's very easy to become very self-critical and very judgmental of oneself and very negative like the intrusive intrusive thoughts I'd get were, were horrendous just the constant berating of myself from my own voice all the time and it wasn't through doing journaling meditation therapy work that I started shining a light on these thoughts and being like oh my god is that what I say to myself on a regular basis like oh my god and I'm still learning now like I still have issues with the whole belief around I'm not good enough I'm not deserving I'm not you know um worthy and that's because of what's happened to me as a child. So I'm still working on that now. However, I've healed to such an extent and I've got such a level of awareness and knowledge about what's going on that it doesn't debilitate me. It used to literally debilitate me. Like I'd wake up and I'd be depressed or anxious and I'd be like, what's the point? I don't want to get yeah. out of bed, um, you know, and, and things would trigger me. And then because of my emotional dysregulation, which is often... Um, um, Tim, borderline personality disorder, things, you overreact to things. So someone could make a slight remark or f- like, for example, recently, for example, recently, um, I, I've got, a, a, there's a vid, there's a real video on, on Instagram that's just gone viral. It's had an, um, over half a million views already in two weeks. And um, I've got hundreds of beautiful comments. However, there's, well, there's two that are not, not, not so great, but there's one comment on there that is basically saying that what I'm doing is fake. It's not real. You've just taken a picture. And obviously I'm like, well, if you, if you had the time to watch my time lapse videos, you'd be able to see that I don't. But that one comment out of all of those beautiful comments, for some strange reason, I'm focused on that one comment. But that, because of what I know, is our survival mechanism. 
we focus on the negative a lot more than we focus on the positive. That's why the news sells the way it does. Um, but it's interesting how that one, one, one negative can send you on a spiral and it can make you feel like crap and you're not good enough and, and all this other stuff. And the thing is for me is to acknowledge that pain because it's triggering something. So it's like acknowledging that, okay, where's this coming from? Oh, it's because I've got self-worth issues. Why is that? Oh, because this happened. Okay, what do you need to do? I need to cry. Oh, I need to go for a run. Oh, I need to walk. Oh, I need to do a bit of meditation. Oh, I need to go, you know, get a bath. Okay, process that. Um, and then and then when you've done that, give yourself compassion and acknowledge, well done, you got through it. You got through that, that tough bit because to other people who have not been through a lot of trauma, that would be nothing. They'd be like, oh, you know what? F off, it's fine. <laughs> but to some people that have been through trauma, it's very triggering, but it, it triggers so much internal pain that that's, we've still not resolved. So for me right now, the journey that I'm on is heading in a really beautiful, positive direction. There's so much light. I feel there's so much love. There's so much support, but I'm open to it now because, again, I had that belief. If you can't trust your parents and you can't trust your family, who can you trust? So I went through life pretty much my whole life as like a lone wolf, not really trusting anyone, not really socializing with people. However, I was always very popular. You know, I was always very, you know, Samantha's really positive. She's always kind. She's always lovely. And I'd go out on, on a few, a few invites to places, just enough so people wouldn't notice anything. However, I hated to be around people because, you know, I just I had that. I was like, people are crazy. <laughs> you know, I've gone through a lot. Yeah, I was like, well, no. Our, well, our your <laughs> earliest traumas were around people. So your nervous system remembers people, mm -mm, not safe. Yeah. So no, you've got animals that. and nature yes. safe. Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Oh. I was like, yeah, that's safe. So yeah, so it was just, you, you, you learn. And, and you know what, if I had to say anything now is be gentle with yourself. Like, Rome wasn't built in a day. I know pe people say that quote a lot, but it wasn't. It's going to be hard. It's going to be ugly. I know, even though I feel really wonderful right now, um, I know that I'm going to dip. I'm going to on. I'm going to be on a on a wave, and and it's it's fine. But the thing is now with the awareness that I've got, I can ride that wave a lot easier than the way I used to. I used to be drowning. I'd literally be splashing around, drowning. I'd be screaming. That's how I'd process my emotion. You know, I'd be like, oh my God, the only way to, to heal is, is through doing something destructive to your body. Now I'm like, okay, I can feel this emotion. Sit with it. Do not suppress it. That's the worst thing you can do. People just, no, I've got stuff to do. No, self-care is so important. Self-compassion, self-respect. Sit there. Everything else goes on hold. Your priority, your number one, you're the most important person right now because how are you meant to help anyone else if you're not helping yourself? So it's like, just sit with yourself, feel the emotion, write it down, give yourself that compassion and empathy. And if you don't know how to give yourself compassion and empathy, start reading books, start watching YouTube videos, how to, be, how to find more empathy for myself or how to cultivate self-compassion. Kristen Neff. Kristen Neff does an incredible um, book. She's um, she's an author and, and it's called. We've had her on the podcast. She's been on the oh, podcast wow. recently. Yeah. Oh my recently. goodness. Oh, oh, her book is amazing. I'm yeah. trying to look for it on, my, on myself, but it's something compassion. Self, it's just self compassion. Self compassion. It's, it's a phenomenal book. She has a um, she has a newer one. She has a newer oh, wow. another one. Yeah, about fear, self compassion. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm gonna have to get that. Yeah. I'm gonna have, but yeah. Oh. But yeah, but I'm in a good place right now. Yeah. I'm so glad to hear that. It was so lovely to sit down with you and I'm giving you um, a hug. If you were right next to me, I would Yay. give you a big, big hug <laughs> if it was okay with you. <laughs> yes. Yes. Oh, oh, yes. Yes, it is. So a big, big hug. Thank you so much. I'll put all the links to your stuff in the show notes. Thank you for being with us today. Oh, thank you. It was an honor. And I just hope, I just hope someone's gone away with something that can, this, that can really help them or benefit them in some way. And to the main thing is to realize you're not alone. You're not alone. And there's people out there that want to help and want to, want to support you as best they can. So yeah, thank you so much, Monique. It's been a pleasure.